product coach and I teach product. And yeah, two months ago I published this book. And guess what? I have a few copies to give away. So if you want to get one of these copies, scan the QR code, fill up the short form, and maybe you'll be one of the lucky winners. We will announce them in the QA session. What a way to start, right? Giveaways. Always works. All right, last people. Your PMs, you should be able to scan a QR code really fast. All right. So, um, for the majority of my career, I was a product manager for 15 years before, the work, before that I worked in engineering, and today I'm helping product organizations. The way we kind of build the products follow this planning waterfall. That's what I like to call it. We start with a strategy. We take a long time to develop the strategy. But in most cases, it's actually a plan. It's not supposed to, but it is a plan. It's a roadmap on steroids, really. And then we do the actual roadmap. Could be a year, could be six months, could be a quarter. And then it turns into project with their product backlogs. And then it flows into agile development. Great, we're agile, right? Is there anything agile about this picture whatsoever? Absolutely not. How do we know this? When we get a new VP and they decide to change the strategy, guess what? The whole plan needs to be erased. We need to do the whole boring thing all over. It takes a lot of time and effort of really busy people to do all of this. But isn't paying off? I think the answer is a resounding no. Because first, the execution never really follows the plan. You know how it is. It, things take longer. Things get canceled. All of a sudden, we're doing this thing that no one really expected, but we decided to do it mid-year. But maybe even worse is the fact that following the plan doesn't really move our key metrics, doesn't help our users. Uh, most of the usage and the revenue comes from old products we launched years ago, that found product market fit years ago, and we're struggling to actually make an impact. And that's the case in company after company I see. So why is this? What's, what's going on? The thing is, the problems we're trying to solve are very complex, are very ambiguous. They're not as they may, might seem, and there's always too little to too much information. It's really hard to know what's going to work in the market, in which customer segment, what are their needs, latest technologies, there's so many moving parts. But we need to decide under time pressure. We need to complete the plan during yearly planning. How many of you are going to participate in some sort of yearly planning in the next couple of months? Wow. We're definitely in Europe. Uh, isn't that fun, right? <laughs> But we have a very powerful tool to do the planning. This is it, our brains. We use opinions, we use judgment, we use groupthink, we use politics, we use hippo. We have a lot of ways and they all rely basically on judgment. There's some data involved, but it's mostly our opinions. And the problem is any psychologist will tell you when you give our brains this challenge, which is something that is complex and ambiguous and has too much or too little information, and you need to decide under time pressure, the results are extremely terrible. We use heuristics, we use cognitive biases, and we end up with plans that are filled with bad ideas that are unvalidated or unsubstantiated. And that's just the case, that's just the way it works. So what do we do about this? So there are good news. In the recent decades, we started having a lot more tools to offer us data, to do research. So now you know, we know how to do user research. Now we understand how to do data analytics and use data science. And now with the internet, we're capable of researching the market, the competition, much better. So all of these things are useful because they give us evidence. Evidence is fact, facts and data that can kind of support our assumptions of the world or refute them. And they help us kind of escape our image of the world, our opinions, our judgment, and force us to confront reality. And that's a really good thing, because in science, in medicine, in law, we discovered that combining human judgment with evidence is a great thing. It supercharges our brains. It enables us to make better decisions. You would never trust a judge just to pass the judgment, even if it's the smartest person uh, and most experienced, just based on their opinion. They would have to see the evidence and then pass judgment. You would never trust a doctor to just prescribe a treatment without looking at the x-rays or the lab results, right? Why are we doing this in, in product? Why are we trusting our judgment so much? 
So, of course, this is no, not a new concept. Evidence-guided development, and I like guided, not based, because it's still based on our judgment, but just guided by the data, has been a thing for a long time. If you know anything about uh, user research, about design thinking, product discovery, uh, lean startup, even growth marketing, this is, these are all ways to combine evidence with judgment and to build better products. Um, but you need to, to put them together. You need to create a framework. And I created mine. It's called GIST, just because there weren't enough frameworks out there. So we needed another one. And it stands for goals, ideas, steps, and tasks. And based on my experience, both positive and negative, and including here in Zurich when I worked for uh, Google on Gmail, I found that these are four areas that we can change, we can improve to bring evidence into the picture. And it's, these are hard changes, but if you break them into these four, they're very impactful. Goals are about the outcomes we're trying to achieve, of course. We will not cover them today, but I've, you have my book for that. Uh, ideas are about potential ways to achieve the goals. Steps are about how do we validate these ideas, how we test them. And tasks are about this agile layer at the bottom, whether it's Kanban or Agile, we don't, or, or, or Scrumban. We don't change that, we just connect it to the other tiers. And again, this is all covered in much more details in my book, and you have a link there if you want to, to read more about it. So what I want to do today is focus on product discovery, and especially these two middle layers, the ideas and, um, and steps layers, and see how product discovery works in an evidence-guided way. So the first thing to realize is that ideas come from everywhere and all the time. Sure, we can do a double diamond, we can research our users and find problems and opportunities, we can research technology, we can research the market, and this gives us really good ideas. But ideas come organically also from your customers, from your managers, from your team. Should we just discard these ideas and tell people, hey, I'm doing a double diamond here, you cannot give me ideas out of that process. No, you cannot, you must take them into account. And that's normal, we just need to collect these ideas. And I updated this slide based on your Reeves presentation yesterday. Now we have another source. Yes, generated, if we didn't have enough people with opinion, now we have also this thing uh, to tell us what to do. The next thing we need to realize is most of these ideas are not good. How do we know this? If we put them into A-B experiments, and this has been tried again and again in company after company, the best case scenario is one in three, one in three will actually succeed. In many cases, it's one in 10. Now, there is some bias here. Some of these failures are because the experiments failed, but when you talk to the experts, they say that's maybe five, 10%. So best case scenario, it's one in a 40% failure rate. Oh, sorry, 40% success rate or 50% success rate. That still means that half of what we develop is waste. That's including your roadmap, or the one you're going to create in a few weeks from now, and your product backlog at the moment, half. Do you know which half it is? <laughs> All right. So what do we do about this? Uh, science has an answer. This is Linus Pauling. He's a double Nobel Prize winner. He helped discover the structure of the DNA. What he has to say is if you want to have good ideas, you must have many ideas. Most of them will be wrong. And what you have to learn is which ones to throw away. It's simple and boring. It's just let's try more ideas. So how do we do this? Here is a flow diagram. I'm an ex-engineer. I like flow diagrams. The goals come from the top. Again, those are outcomes. We didn't cover this layer, uh, but uh, there's a method behind it. Ideas come from our research and from people who contribute. And now what do we do? Now we go into product discovery and there's two phases. The first one is evaluation. We need to systematically and quickly and objectively evaluate ideas. And the result of that, and it's a very positive result, is most of these ideas will be parked. We will determine they're not good enough to work on right now as they're compared to others. We put them aside. That's good because it gives us more room to evaluate more ideas. We want to fill up these uh, funnels constantly. Some ideas we consider good and those we will validate. Validate is, means building a version of the idea and testing it some way, usually putting it in front of customers. And the nice thing about this validation funnel is that it generates evidence. And that evidence enables us to reevaluate our ideas. And guess what? A lot of the ones we thought were good 
will actually get parked again because they're not so good. Other rules will be pivoted based on the evidence and tested again. And some are just good, we'll continue validating them. And that again gives us more room to, to test more ideas. And that's very important. Some ideas will pass the whole thing and will come to the conclusion with enough confidence, and we're going to explain what this means, that they are good enough to launch. And those, we switch into delivery, and we start delivering them, and we launch them. And I assure you, these launches are going to be of higher impact than the ones that we started out with, and potentially from the ones that you're doing right now. Why is that? Because we filtered a lot of the bad ideas. We also improved the good ones, because a good idea needs iteration. Good, let's do an example. This is whole theoretical. Let's talk about concrete example. Imagine that you're a product manager in a company developing some sort of CRM system, helping support customers of small businesses. So your customers are the small businesses. They're, they're supporting their customers. They're telling them about today's offering, what's in the menu, opening hours. They're answering their common questions. Um, it's kind of all in one. They're sending invoices, but as we look at the data, it's clear that they are churning too much. We currently have 5% churn per month. We want to put it at 3.5%. That's the goal. That's the metric. And when we evaluate, when we discuss this with the uh, when we research it, we find that they're very busy. And they are flooded with these messages. But they don't find enough value in our tool to switch over from you know, WhatsApp or email or whatever they're used to using. So, Someone comes up with this idea, which is pretty obvious in today's environment. Let's build a chatbot. The chatbot will answer some of the common repetitive questions. If someone asks what's the opening hours, the chatbot will give the answer. Someone asks what's on today's menu, the chatbot will help. Common problem, so how to solve it, the chatbot will answer. Great. Everyone's excited. The management, they read all the blog posts on the, on the news, they hear the news, they know they have to do something about AI. Everyone has to do something about AI today, right? Uh, the team, they just love this idea. They want to build this machine learning model. Everyone's pushing for this idea. You're the product manager. What do you do? If it was me for most of my career, I would say yes. It's hard to stand in the, in, in the way of this consensus. Everyone wants to launch this thing. You don't want to be the bad guy. But maybe there's a better way. Let's try it. So we start with evaluation. I'm using ICE here, impact, confidence, and ease. And I'm actually starting just with two of those, impact and ease. Impact tries to assess what's going to be the positive effect of this idea on the target metric. In this case, churn. How much will it reduce churn? 10 out of 10 is like maximum you can imagine for a single project. One or zero, which is What's mo what most ideas will do is almost no, no impact at all. So we think this is a nine. It's a game changer. It's a big idea. That's our uh, belief. Is is like the opposite of effort. It's how easy or hard is it going to be to implement this thing. And we think it's a three, which means not so super easy. It will take us a number of person months, almost a year maybe, to build this thing. It's a big project. Good. We did the evaluation, all the managers are getting a little bit impatient. All right, it's a big idea. Yeah, it's going to cost some time. Let's do it. What, what's keeping us? Wait, there's another part to ICE, and that's confidence. And confidence asks a very simple question. How sure are you that it's actually a 9 and a 3, and not a 1 and a 7, for example? What's, what's the basis of your confidence. And then, of course, you can say, well, we're all small people and that's our opinion, or someone else launched a, a chatbot, or that's the trend in the industry. And those are all forms of evidence, but they're not all at the same weight. It's hard to evaluate evidence. So for that purpose, I created this colorful tool, which I call the confidence meter. How many of you have seen this thing before? How many are using it today? All right. Quite a few of you. All right, that's, that's a good sign for me. Uh, so no need to explain. I will move on. No. <laughs> Basically, it kind of tries to map the evidence that you have and give you a confidence score. And it goes from very low confidence, which is the dark blue area, to very high confidence, which is the red area. It's like a thermometer. And it gives you a number between 0 and 10, as you can see. And the dark blue area, the upper right corner, is all about opinions, your own opinion as the originator of the idea, 
or the opinion of the industry, or is it part of the strategy? These are all opinions. They don't give you a lot of confidence, unfortunately, because opinions are very unreliable ways to, um, to evaluate ideas. So they give you a maximum 0.1 out of 10 confidence. The bottom right corner is about um, evaluating the idea a bit deeper. So you can do uh, various sort of uh, reviews with your colleagues or managers or stakeholders or experts, and that's a harder test a little bit. Or you can do an estimate and build a model on paper, and some ideas actually die. But this is still pretty low confidence. It's a lot of numbers pulled out, out of thin hair, so it's 0.5. Then you move into collecting data. You're not building anything yet, you're just collecting available data. And it could come from your logs or from user research or from other sources. And it could be anecdotal data, just a few data points. And that often is misleading. It seems like something is happening, but it's just uh, random noise. Or it could be what I call market data, which is a little bit up in the wheel, which is larger data sets that come from surveys or from deep competitive analysis or from other forms of research. The medium and high confidence comes from testing the idea. That's the red area in the upper uh, left corner. And there are various forms of tests that give you more and more confidence. And full confidence is just from launching the whole thing. Let's look how the whole thing works for our chatbot idea. So I'm going to go over the different categories of confidence and ask myself whether or not I have this. Self-conviction, do I think it's a good idea? Yes, I think it's great, 0.01 out of 10. Why so low? Because every terrible idea that ever existed, someone thought it was great. Uh, pitch deck, I did a pitch deck. It's, uh, it's, you know, if you don't know what a pitch deck is, it's a slide deck that's explained what it's a great, why it's a, it is a great idea. 0.03, I did it. Thematic support. Is there a theme behind chatbots at the moment? Absolutely. It's, it's huge. When I wrote this example four years ago, it was also big, and then it dipped in the middle, if you remember. It, became, it went out of fashion, now it's back in fashion. So it just shows you how unreliable thematic support is. Others' opinion. Yeah, everyone in the company loves this idea. Estimates and plans we haven't done yet. And one competitor has a chatbot. That gives us what we call anecdotal evidence. It's there in the, in the low area of confidence. In many companies, if they think it's a good idea, so they have the opinions, and the leading competitor has this feature, that's it, validation done. Let's just launch and build the, the whole thing. But not this case. So we're going to sum up the numbers. It comes up to around 0 0.8, and now we have a full ICE score. And what does it mean? Nothing. It doesn't say anything. You cannot actually, it doesn't tell you let's launch or not launch. It just gives you something to discuss. And that's the really important part of every process. It's not about delegating all the decision to a spreadsheet. It's actually supercharging our discussions. And now the discussion should be, yeah, we think it's a great idea. Yeah, we think it's going to take three out of 10 effort or is to build, but we know basically nothing. It's all based on opinions and one competitor having it. So what should we do? And I think a reasonable thing to do in this case is to try to validate the idea, and that's the job of steps. And there are many ways to validate ideas, of course. I try to kind of collect them into five buckets, assessment, fact-finding, tests, experiments, and release results, catchy acronym after. And of course, the things on the left-hand side are cheap to do, but they don't give you very strong evidence or high confidence. The things on the right, the more you move to the right, the more expensive and rigorous they are. So we already did one. We did ice analysis just based on what we know today. That's always the first step in every evaluation of every idea. In many cases, it's enough to park the ideas, but we're going to go further. We could, of course, assess it further in different ways or collect data, and that's usually where we start. But in this case, we're more ambitious. We're going to jump into a test, and we're going to do a combination of a user study, uh, sorry, a usability test, and a Wizard of Oz. So we invite 12 participants into, into our lab. We, show the, we interview them. Then we show them the chatbot actually working. How is it working? It's, it's, a, it's a Wizard of Oz. It's a, one of the teammates is actually simulating behind the scenes the bot. Top tip, if you want an intelligent bot, pick an intelligent teammate. <laughs> and then magic happens. Then they start giving us facts and data that are interesting. So first off, we realize not all of them are loving it. And they have the reasons. First off, it's 
they're not technical enough to, to know how to use this thing, how to train it, how to do the handoffs. Second, a lot of their customers expect a personal touch. My menu changes every day. The opening hours are flexible. So we realized that actually this is not going to be the big hit, the nine out of 10 that we thought. So we started here, but now we realize actually the impact might be four. It's going to be impactful for some people. They will churn less, but not for the entire population of our customers. And also we realized there are more edge cases, so the, it's not going to be as easy as we think. So we adjust it to two. But on the positive side, we have more confidence about these numbers. You see there's a little bump of two, and now we have 2.8 confidence. What does it mean? Whatever we decide it means. We need to have a discussion again, and we could decide to park this idea now, or we could decide to test it again. I don't think such an expensive idea. I would go ahead and build the whole thing now and decide it's validated. So let's do another one. Uh, we go now to a longitudinal user study, which if you don't know this, it's a technique I learned here in Google. You basically recruit a few hundreds of our customers, let's say 200. You give them a version, a kind of an alpha version of the product that is not polished, not fully complete, but it gives the core scenarios, the core value we expect, and you allow them to use it just for two weeks, and you monitor the usage, and you also send them surveys to ask them how, how is it going, if they like it. And that's a really good kind of simulation of what will happen after you launch. And what we learn is actually more people like it and start to use it and are more likely to not churn because of it than we expect. And they also explain why and they build workflows. So it's a little bit more positive than we thought. So now we can adjust our impact to a five, from four to five. And also the ease goes up to four. Why is it four? because we already build the alpha. And while some of this code is throwaway code, we understand much better how to build a thing. We also already have some working code in place. So now it's a shorter jump. And now we have 5.8 uh, confidence, which is medium high, if you go back to my uh, tool. And that's good enough to make a decision and to say, you know what? Why don't we just launch the whole thing uh, and switch to uh, delivery? Oh, you can also decide to kill it based on this data. That's also legitimate. Or in some companies where they are more risk averse, they might say, let's do another step, let's say an A-B experiment. All of these are valid answers in this case. The important thing is the discussion. What does it mean for the yearly planning that you guys are going to do? I would argue you could plan in a different way now. First, you, do, you put these yellow bars. You, you put your goals, the company goals or the business unit goals, on a timeline. These are objectives, like we want to reduce churn, we want to enhance user security and privacy, and each one should have outcomes as well. So the key results that are measurable that tell us whether or not we achieve this objective, and you can kind of try to line them up on a timeline. But then you need to ask yourself, what work should we put on this timeline to actually achieve the goal? And the honest answer is often we need to start with research because we don't know enough, we don't know about what's causing customers to churn, um, so that's not a bad thing. A, a little bit of research can really save a lot of effort down the road if we chase the wrong opportunities. Uh, but you can time box research. You can say we're not more than three weeks research or four weeks research, and if we didn't come up with any valid ideas or anything that looks good, we switch goals or do something else. Then we need to do product discovery, which is what I showed you. The result of product discovery, it shoots out a number of validated ideas that can go into delivery. So that's another kind of wild guess, how long will it take us to do product discovery? You can time box it, or you can just say, we'll give it as much, long, as much time as we need, because we're also building. We're building and learning, so it's not wasting time. And then you can go into uh, delivery in the uh, left-hand side. I left it blank. I don't know how long it will take. I'm just guessing here. And in the right-hand side, this is what it li looks like when you discovered stuff. And that part, this delivery is actually, actually exactly what like the release roadmaps that we're used to. This is actually output, this is launches, but it's completely valid to do this because these are validated ideas. We know that launching them with high probability will achieve the, the outcomes we want. And of course, there's also effect delay. The, the outcome will not be achieved immediately, it will take some time to get there. My last slide. If you do this, a lot of dynamics will change because instead of just convincing each other with opinions, instead of arguing over ideas, instead of having vague goals, 
you will start having a much more constructive discussion up, down, across, and everyone will be more on the same page and have a lot more visibility. Because if you can show your leaders, these are the ideas that we're evaluating. These are the results we're seeing. This is the evidence, and this is why we chose to launch idea A, not idea B. It kind of builds trust. And trust is a key word that is missing in a lot of organizations that I see today. So this is a very important way to build trust. It also empowers the people at the bottom, the, the value creators, to see a larger part of the picture, to see that it's not just about moving tasks to the done state, but rather about completing steps and learning from them and achieving, launching ideas or finding the right ideas and connecting to goals that they, they're supposed to deliver on. So they become not just the, a product delivery team, but also a product discovery team, in a sense. And lastly, the person in the middle, the PM, I think that person has a much more interesting job now, not just the administrator of the roadmap or, you know, the backlog master, but uh, someone who's driving this process of discovery and helping the company find that product that delivers maximum value to the customers and captures maximum value back. If any of this is interesting for you guys, I have a few resources. Of course, the book that some of you are going to win very shortly, and but you can also buy it. Top tip. Uh, and I have also some free resources. If you go to my website, you can download the confidence meter as a spreadsheet. You can download an ebook explaining the after framework and a bunch of other stuff. So please feel free. Mm -hmm.